In this video, I want to introduce a term that is very commonly used inside the philosophy of science, but not so commonly used outside of that context. It's the concept of an interpretation of a scientific theory. We need this concept to talk about what it would mean for a theory or a model to be true. And to avoid repetition, I'm just going to talk about theories. You can always read that as theory or model. The other goal of this video is to lay out some of the reasons why interpreting theories is very challenging and why it may be more accurate to view the project of interpretation as a philosophical project rather than as a strictly scientific project. So in the usage that I'm using, which is standard in the philosophy of science, to interpret a theory or to give an interpretation of a theory is to provide an answer to the following question. If a theory is true, what must the world be like? And notice the if. We're assuming for the sake of this exercise that the theory is true. What we're trying to do is figure out what that would imply about the world. Here's another way to say it. What must be true of the world if the theory is true? And here's another way again. What does the theory tell us about the world if the theory is true? These are all the same question. They're all asking us to consider what we would be justified in believing about reality if a given theory or model is true. So an interpretation of a theory is whatever description would replace the question mark in this picture. Now, this might seem like an easy question to answer. It might seem like you could just look at a theory and read off the interpretation. But this is, in fact, one of the oldest and most challenging questions in the philosophy of science. Let me run through a few reasons why this is so. First, we need to specify what we mean by a theory or model being true. This is also just a placeholder with a label. Intuitively, we think of this as a relation of correspondence of some kind. Assertions made by the theory correspond in some way to facts about the world. But how do we pick out those assertions? And what kind of facts do they describe? And we've already seen a number of objections to this idea that theories interpret themselves. What's the role in the agent of all this? How does our use of a theory bear on how a theory represents the world? Second, if theories or models are true, they'll be true in some respects and not others. We need to be clear about what these respects are. And third, we need to pay attention to the question, what does our theory ignore? Theories and models work because they abstract away from certain features of the world, aspects that don't matter to our reasoning about the world. What's left are the aspects that do matter. These are the aspects that our theories and models have in common with the physical systems that they're used to represent. These elements that are shared in common will be the basis for whatever interpretation we come up with. And fourth, even if we can answer these questions and we can identify the similarities that matter, the description of the world that is necessitated by a theory will always be an incomplete description of the physical reality that's out there, which means that there are parts of this description that are open that aren't necessitated by the theory. This leaves room for multiple descriptions of the world that could fill in the holes in different ways. In fact, it's almost always the case that a theory will allow for multiple interpretations. The parts that are necessitated by the theory will be shared but the parts that are not necessitated may differ. And each of these interpretations will generate the same observable predictions because they share those parts in common, the parts that are the basis for the way we use the theory in our reasoning about the world. So we can find ourselves in a situation where a theory is open to multiple interpretations that are distinct but potentially incompatible in the sense that they can't all be true at once. They literally contradict each other. But each of the interpretations is compatible with theory in the sense that they share all the features that we actually rely on when we reason with a theory, like when we generate testable predictions about what we should observe in the world from the theory. This is a general problem for interpreting theories, but maybe the most egregious example of this problem in science is the long history of debate over the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics. Here you have a situation where the best theory in the world, the most empirically successful theory that human beings have ever come up with, has no consensus interpretation. I've listed four of these candidates here that have been historically influential on philosophical discussions, but you could easily list a dozen. 
Now, in some respects, quantum theory is unique in the interpretive challenge that it poses, but in other respects, it's not. You get this problem in quantum theory partly because it's so well formulated that it's possible to draw a clear distinction between the empirical content of the theory and the philosophical superstructure that surrounds our attempts to interpret it as a theory of the structure of the world. For most theories in science, especially outside of physics, it's different. For most theories, it's hard enough just to come up with any clear, well-grounded interpretation, much less a number of well-grounded competitors. However, it should be said that these debates about interpretation are not immediately relevant to the daily work of most scientists. If you work in the foundations of biology or the foundations of cognitive science or social science, you'll need to pay careful attention to these debates. But if you're like most scientists working on solving problems that use a given theory or developing applications of a given theory or developing new theories, a lot of these issues are rightly treated as philosophical debates within your field rather than a part of the core conceptual toolkit that scientists in your field are expected to learn to solve practical problems. Now, why is this? How is this possible? It's possible because theories and models in science were originally developed as tools for reasoning about our experience of the world and only indirectly about the world itself. And they can play this role perfectly well, independent of these philosophical concerns about coming up with a unique, consistent, complete description of the world. There is every reason to think of this as a philosophical project more than a scientific project. Now, that's not to say that it's not a worthwhile philosophical project. I certainly think it is. It's one of the great questions of philosophy. And that's not to say that science shouldn't play a foundational role in this project. I think it's clear that it has to. Uh, science is the best method we have for answering certain kinds of questions about nature. But the tool set for making a contribution to this more ambitious project, for giving an account of the deep nature of reality, is necessarily going to include philosophical tools and a background in these more foundational philosophical debates. That's the way the best work in this field is done. So I hope I've given you some insight into the challenges of interpreting scientific theories and models, but also some reason to think of this as a philosophical project rather than as a scientific project, but a project that's worth pursuing and one where science can and should play a foundational role.